Welcome to Cincinnati Sessions, a production of the University of Cincinnati Internal Medicine Residency. I'm your host, Chris Martindale, and today's topic is statin-associated muscle symptoms. Let's start with the case. We have a 46-year-old male with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and coronary artery disease who presents the clinic with concerns for muscle pain. He's currently taking a torvastatin 40 milligrams per day and has read online that this can cause his symptoms. Of note, a torvastatin, as you see in the figure on the right, was the second most prescribed medication in 2020, so you could imagine this may not be an uncommon circumstance. His initial labs in clinic are pertinent for a normal creatinine, a normal urinalysis, and a CK elevated to 11,742. At this point in time, we decided to temporarily stop the statin and see him back in clinic in eight weeks for follow-up. Now for our clinical question. What diagnostic tests would you like to order at follow-up, and how would the results of that test impact your management of this patient? At this time, pause the video and try to answer this question for yourself. If you're next to someone, present the case to them and discuss it together. After you try to answer the question, resume the video. To step back and consider this case closely, let's first consider how statins work and how that could be related to the side effects we are seeing. The primary mechanism of action of statins is as an inhibitor of the enzyme HMG-CoA reductase. Overall, inhibition of this enzyme decreases cholesterol within the cell. This promotes two separate things. One, we lower LDL in the serum by increasing the production of LDL receptors in the cell. The increased receptors promote increased uptake of LDL and therefore lower levels in the blood. Second, the lower cholesterol in the cell decreases the secretion of VLDL. Both this and the increased absorption of LDL decrease serum cholesterol. Although lower cholesterol is the therapeutically targeted downstream effect caused by inhibition of the HMG-CoA reductase pathway, it does not occur in isolation. Through the same pathway, we also see effects on other intracellular processes, including isoprenylation of proteins, glycosylation, and formation of ubiquinone or coenzyme Q10. In myocytes, the secondary effects can cause disruptions in the cell, such as problems with the cell membrane, dysfunction of mitochondria, or even creation of dysfunctional proteins. Altogether, these things can combine to cause cell degradation. Although it's still incompletely understood, this is currently the leading theory on the cause of the muscle side effects related to statins. Now, when considering that statins' primary target of action is in the hepatocytes of the liver, we must ask how the statin itself gets into myocytes to cause these effects. This requires stepping back a few years into basic physiology of cellular membranes, in which we learned that hydrophobic or lipophilic substances can go straight through membranes, whereas hydrophilic molecules require a transporter to pass through the membranes. Utilizing knowledge of these properties of statins lets us estimate or guess which ones might be more likely to cause side effects by having easier entry into cells. On the table on the right, we see statins categorized by whether they're lipophilic or not. And in this case, we would know that lipophilic statins are more likely to enter cells and cause side effects. Of note, that is historically interesting to me, there was a statin called Sereva statin in the late 1990s that actually had to be withdrawn from the market due to increased rhabdo, and this was actually the most lipophilic statin that existed. So, to turn this into something clinically relevant, it is typically our first goal to stratify the degree of muscle injury in patients. Typically, we use the CK as a measurable surrogate of this muscle injury, and the paper from which I've taken this figure on the left, they categorize into three different sections. First, in patients with muscle pain and a normal CK, they categorize that as only myalgia. If the CK is less than 10 times the upper limit of normal, they call it myositis or myopathy. And in patients with CK greater than 10 times the upper limit of normal, they suggest checking renal function and urinalysis to rule out rhabdo. Of note, in actual clinical practice, context is important, and there is not an existent strict cutoff of 10 times the upper limit of normal to differentiate these side effects. Overall, some degree of muscle symptom will be experienced by 10 to 25 percent of patients on statins as a whole, with myopathy and actual muscle damage as evidenced by elevated CK in approximately 1 out of 10,000 treated persons per year. 
The majority of these side effects resolve with statin discontinuation, and we typically follow these patients up in eight weeks, assuming symptoms are not progressive. If progressive, we actually need to see them a bit sooner. If we find that symptoms are persistent in eight weeks or the CK remains elevated, we need to consider an alternative diagnosis called statin-associated or statin-induced autoimmune myopathy. This is a rare diagnosis occurring in two to three out of 100,000 patients treated with statins and can occur either early in the treatment course or even after years in patients who have not experienced any symptoms. The classic presentation is symmetric, proximal muscle weakness, and pain. The pain is important because it differentiates it from other inflammatory myopathies. CK is typically greater than 10 times the upper limit of normal, and importantly, the CK and symptoms persist despite stopping the statin. In this clinical context, the test of choice is an anti-HMG CoA reductase autoantibody. If this is positive in the serum, you have your diagnosis. Other supplementary findings that can help or EMG or MRI findings consistent with myopathy. Treatment for this condition is to permanently stop statin and never put these patients back on one, and then we typically start steroids at about one milligram per kilogram per day, plus or minus a secondary agent such as methotrexate, azathioprine, or mycophenolate pending rheumatology recommendations. More often than not, this requires a long and slow taper of these agents over months or even years until these patients can return to their baseline. Now, to return to our case, we asked what diagnostic tests we would like to order at follow-up and how that would impact management of our patient. And the answer was repeat CK testing. If the CK had significantly decreased, we could consider restarting a statin with a different agent or lower dose, and if persistently elevated, workup for statin-associated autoimmune myopathy should be pursued and statin permanently discontinued. Finally, with some questions for reflection. The answers to these can either be found in the preceding slides or with a little bit of extra research if you're interested. One, if a statin can be restarted in a patient who has experienced muscle-related symptoms, what information about the statin selected could help us reduce the risk of recurrent symptoms? Two, what other testing should be performed to evaluate other causes for elevated CK in patients on statins with muscle pain? And three, if you're interested in a little bit of extra research, if the statin must be permanently discontinued, are there other classes of lipid-lowering drugs with proven benefit for ASCVD prevention? At this time, pause the video and try to answer these questions alone or with a friend. Specifically, try to say the answers out loud. If you have to, rewind the video or use other sources to find the answers to these questions. Thank you for watching this Cincinnati session on statin-associated muscle symptoms. Be sure to check out other videos in the series.